he explains the whole concept of ex nihilo. He cites in the footnote of Ramban, Ahmadides, at the beginning of creation, the first day of creation, God says, let there be light. Let there be light. Then the Torah says, and God saw that the light was good. Well, it's evident. If God said, let there be, and anything God does is good. So why does it say, and God saw the light was good? So Nachmardis explains, let there be light, that is ex nihilo. Nothing existed, light exists. Now the question is, the ongoing willing of that light, does it become a permanent part of creation? By saying God saw it was good, that's a confirmation that not only it's coming for the moment, but God will continuously will that light should continue as being part of creation. And we find every day of creation, same thing. Let the, bee, let the waters gather. God saw it was good, the vegetation, whatever it may be. Saying, and he saw it was good means because it is that, therefore he will continuously will whatever initially he brought in from, from the, to ex nihilo, from nothing to something. Now, what preceded existence? Nothing. Nothing. Only God existed. In the words of Rambam, Maimonides, in the laws of the fundamentals of Torah, everything that exists is dependent on something else. So if every aspect of creation only exists because God willed it to be come into, into being, so why does it exist? It's dependent on God's willing it, it should exist. But God himself, that God himself always existed. He's pre-existence. Because God is infinite, meaning he's not dependent on anything. He's all self-contained. So nothing wills God. God is. Anything outside of God is God wills. And even when he wills, to what degree does he will it? Does he will it for the moment? Or does he continuously will that it should continue in the context that he initially he brought into existence? Whether it's the light, whether it's the earth, whether it's the heavens, whatever, whatever it may be. We find we have the ten plagues of Egypt. The water turned to blood. First of the plagues. We find that when Moshe says to Paro that when the water turns to blood, the fish in the Nile will die. Isn't it obvious? If the fish, if the water is blood, the fish live in water, they're not able to live in blood. So the Sepharno, in his commentary, explains sorcery could also turn water to blood. But when it changes to blood, it can't change the essence of what it is. It could change its appearance. But it's an innate makeup. Only God can make that difference. So let's say through sorcery, you turn water into blood. In terms of the actual chemical makeup of the blood, it's, it's H2O. Fish could live in that water, although it has the texture of blood, it has all the characteristics of blood, but it's in, in its essence, it's not blood. When God says the water should turn to blood, the water was no longer water. God willed that she blood, but how, how did blood come about? How does anything come about? So the water turning to blood is the quim of ex nihilo. That's exactly what it is. As the water is water from moment to moment, why is it water from moment to moment? Because God wills every moment he releases energy to be water. So if in any moment he chooses not to release the energy for water, now in the location where the water is, he wills there should be blood. The energy that brings blood, that's what that's why blood exists there. But fish can't live in blood. Therefore, it wasn't enough to say the Niles can turn to blood but the fish are going to die because dying is a confirmation that this is not sorcery, but rather this is ex nihilo, that God first now is causing the blood to become blood and the water no longer exists. Like we speak about at the end of time, 
after 6,000 years. It's not the world's going to be destroyed. When you think about destruction, it means you have something, you destroy it. You dismantle it. But you have the remnants of, the, of what, was, what was destroyed. When God ceases willing existence, there's no trace of that original existence. Because the basis for trace or anything is God willing that. So the moment he ceases to release the energy, there's no basis for existence. That's what's going to happen the year, at the year of 6,000. The water in the Nile no, it no longer existed. It's not the water was converted to blood. The Nile now had blood in it. Fish can't live in blood. Therefore, they died. That's the whole understanding. So within existence, whatever exists, it only exists because he conditionally wills the existence. The Mara tells over the story, which I mentioned a number of times over the past year, Rabbi Hanina Mendoza, who was a very special Jew, he was so special, God says the whole world is sustained in his merit. His daughter didn't have oil to light the Shabbos candles, olive oil. She only had vinegar. So Rechanin Benosa says, so what's the problem? As God decrees oil should burn, God could decree vinegar should burn. Now, why is oil a flammable and vinegar is not? Because the energy that God releases to give oil to have the characteristics of a flammable, that's why it's a flammable. But if you should will that vinegar should have the ability to be the equivalent of oil or even longer burning fuel, it burns longer. And he says to his daughter, why don't you try it? She takes this flask of vinegar, puts the wicks in, lights it, and it burnt longer than the oil would have burnt. And it burnt till Motsoy Shabbos that they were able to say Abdullah on that, can on that light of that oil, the vinegar that was burning instead of the oil burning. What's that miracle? That miracle is that the energy God released for vinegar no longer has the characteristics of vinegar. This vinegar has characteristics of a flammable. That's what it is. We find the greatest of the miracles was the splitting of the sea. And the Mishra tells us that instead of the water flowing horizontally, it flowed vertically. Could you imagine? The water of, of the Red Sea was flowing vertically, and for hundreds and hundreds of miles, people were able to see the splitting of the sea. It was never seen before. The water being a vertical stream upward. Whatever happened to the laws of gravity? I mean, how does the water? You mean it, it shot up with such force, and the force just kept going. It, it was just... A vertical stream of water, a wall of water, vertical. How? How is that possible? Now, why is there gravity? Why is there anything? Because God wills every moment. That's how existence should function. And that's the experience of life on this planet. Why, when you go out of the orbit of the earth, there's no more gravity? Because whatever the value of outside orbit, or, orbit has, gravity is not, not, not essential there. Therefore, God doesn't will gravity. But on the earth where man lives and you have to function, gravity is the essential for our function. Otherwise, you can't function unless there's gravity. The body doesn't function. The maintenance of blood pressure what the digestive system, nothing functions without gravity. It's an essential in our function. But that's all God willing. God wills that. We talk about resurrection. Why is resurrection? If you understand that existence is ex nihilo, and every moment of existence is ex nihilo, because God continuously wills every moment. As the Ramban says, when God said it was good, it means, therefore, it's going to be. It's going to continue. God said, after Adam made of the tree of knowledge, he's subject to death. That means there's such a thing as a lifespan. 
Once the person, the, the years allocated to a human being is over, the person dies. But the person who's going to be worthy, he'll be resurrected. But how's it possible? His remains decomposed into dust. How from dust do you have a human being? How from this colorless li liquid, when it fertilizes the ovum, how do you have a human being developing? Because God wills that process that the energy from the conception to birth, that's how it happens. And why does a child develop into adolescence, into, a, into an adult, and whatever? And why at one time people lived 800 years and they were vibrant till the very end? Why? Because everything is based upon the energy God releases. If God releases an, age, an energy that the age, till five, eight, age of 500, you're a young person, you're a young person. Just that's why you're a young person up to a certain age, which is a lot less than that. Everything is based on whatever God wills. Person recovers miraculously from a, 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 a terminal illness. For God, it's not, what is it? It's meaningless. The illness is only because something has malfunctioned in the body and therefore the illness, the, the immune system has been breached and therefore something has gone haywire, gone awry. God wills an energy, it doesn't go awry. Person is healthy till the last moment of his life. Doesn't even age. The first human being to age was Avram Avinu. Until Avram Avinu was at a certain age, he did it. There was no aging in existence. He only aged, God introduced aging into existence, so he should be able to discern between Avram and Yitzhak because they looked identical. Otherwise, they couldn't discern between the father and the son. But how's it no aging? It's a natural process. The answer is no. It's only natural because God wills that you be natural. That up to a point, you develop, you advance. After that, you start waning. When you start waning, this is the consequence of waning because God releases another energy which allows aging to be. Until Yaakov, there's no such thing as illness. There's no illness in existence. The first human being ever to become sick. When Yosef was told your father is not well, Yosef knew immediately, it means he's dying. And it was only introduced illness so Yaakov should set his personal affairs in order to bless his children before he dies. And Yosef understood this. When he heard his father was sick, it was unheard of. There's no sickness in existence. But since it was essential, because the blessings Yaakov gave to his children were essential for the future of the Jewish people, he set each one's abilities and capacity, and he defined them. And because he defined them, blessed them, that's why they evolved as they did. Each tribe with its own unique personality and ability, only because of Yaakov's blessings. But if Yaakov would suddenly die, not knowing when he's going to pass away, what happens? God forbid the nation who's going to meet the objective of creation is not going to have the capacity. God introduces illness. Yaakov comes not well. He begins, he understands it's time now to bless his children before he passes away. But again, but if not for Yaakov, and if a person would pass away instantaneously, what, what's the loss? There's no loss. The next child will take over. Yaakov, no. It was essential. He blesses his children before he dies. And he has to define each one what exactly their capacity and their function is vis-a-vis -vis the whole. So God turned over the whole world, changed the course of existence. The reason why the hospitals and doctors and all this is because the Yaakov even. Because there has to be a Jewish people. Otherwise there, wouldn't be, otherwise, there wouldn't be a Jewish people. Because without the blessings that Yaakov gave to his children before he died, without those blessings, would have gone nowhere. Now, Lahabdul, Elif You have the most advanced jet, F-98. It flies 29,000 miles an hour. Okay, it's unbelievable, but you don't have fuel to put in the jet. What's its value? It has no value. But could you imagine the potential if you would have? Could you imagine what the Jewish people would be if they would have been blessed by Yaakov? But if he didn't bless them, you're going nowhere. 
Therefore, God left no stone unturned to make sure Yaakov will bless his children before he dies. And therefore, he became ill. Once he became ill, he knew his time is short. He has to set his house in order. And therefore, he blessed each one. He summed his children. He blessed every one of them. He blessed Yosef's children. That's the reason. There's a verse in Tilim where David says, Hu Omar Vayehi. God said it should be, Hu Vayamod. He gave the directive and it became, it took on a permanence. Puzzling Tilim. Hu Omar Vayehi. Where did Hashem say it should be? Vayehi. Yor. There should be this, there should be that. He gave the directive and it took on a permanent, it took on a permanent status. That's the meaning of that pasuk that David is saying in Tillin. That's the verse. It's very interesting. God forbid a person loses a limb. It's a permanent, it cannot be replaced. Especially if the limb is destroyed, cannot be replaced. When we pray to God for healing, doctor says this, the body, the organ, the system is malfunctioning. And one of the blessings of the Amida is refining. We ask God to heal us. What is the healing process? Right? If there's intervention, you come up with some kind of medication, a pharmaceutical. So the body is failing because it's what? It's deficient in something. So if you compensate the deficiency, the body naturally recovers. Naturally recovers. What about if you didn't give it that infusion? Or they didn't discover yet that type of medication that could address whatever that problem is. A person would die. That's what happens. One time people died of pneumonia. Of course, they didn't have any antibiotic to address the pneumonia. People died of tetanus if they had tetanus. Of course, there wasn't anything to address the tetanus. That's what happened. So now that they've discovered tetanus, the tetanus shop, that deals with that tetanus, which normally a person would die from, or the pneumonia, which normally would cause the lungs to shut down, the person would die. They created, they found the bacteria, uh, antibiotic to deal with it. So why does a person recover? Because the antibiotic interacts with the system and it destroys the bacteria that's destroying the system. Now that the bacteria was destroyed, the body has the ability to recover. How does the recovery take place? Naturally, it takes place. Because that's the way the body functions. Even though it has a setback, it recovers. What allowed it? The medication, the antibiotic. But what does the antibiotic interact the way it interacts? Say, because that's the reality. You put your hand in the fire, you get burnt. Because that's what's supposed to happen. The antibiotic goes into the body, it attacks the bacteria. It vanquishes it. Now the body has the ability to recover. You put your hand in the fire, you get burnt. Why? Because fire burns. So I have a question. So why when Avram went into the kiln, why did he get burnt? Why wasn't he incinerated? Why? You know why? 
Because fire burns only because God says it's supposed to burn. It vaporizes, consumes, incinerates. But if God says it's fire, but this fire doesn't burn. Avram Avinu's clothing weren't even singed. To that degree. Because God wills fire, it only burns because a component of fire means it burns. But if God wills that same energy, we had the story of the burning bush in the Torah. Moshe is shepherding the flocks of his father in the desert, and he sees something unusual. Never saw anything like it. The burning bush, it's burning, and it's not consumed by the fire. Never saw it. Fire consumes. Why is this bush being, being, being consumed? Hasnein and uko. The snack. The thorn bush is not being is not being consumed by the fire. How does that happen? He approaches it. He realizes that this is what this is an angel, a holy angel, speaking to him in the name of God. If you put your hand there, you get burnt. Anyone else? But it's not burning the bush. But it's called the burning bush, not the burnt bush. The burn it's burning, but it's not. Again, same idea. Everything is what it's supposed to be because God wills it. So we pray to God. We have the 13 interim blessings in the Amiga. And we ask for many things. How could it be? Vanquish your enemies. You know how, how many enemies the Jewish people have in this world? During the Middle Ages, you know how many enemies the Jew had? The Jew wasn't safe, regardless of any community he was, anywhere in this world. That was the level of anti-Semitism in the Middle Ages. How did he survive it? How? It's a miracle that every one of them wasn't totally destroyed by, by, by anti-Semitism. You're surrounded, you have nowhere to escape to. But yet, we survived it. It's just divine protection. What does that mean? For some reason, the anti-Semite, which normally would kill us, for some reason, they had a reason not to kill us. But who put that in their minds to see whatever the value is despite their animosity towards the Jew? Again, this is a confirmation that God wills our existence. And he wills it in a way where it's not understandable. It's only because he wills it that way. That's why it is that way. There's something unusual, you know, by us, by Jews. The pedigree is essential, very essential. In Egypt, we were slaves for 210 years. We had masters. The Jewish women were always very attractive. We find when Sari Maine went to Egypt, Avram was concerned that because these people, they never saw such beauty, they may take Sari Maine and kill him. So he concealed her. The Jewish people went to Egypt. They weren't ordinary looking people. But yet, we did 210 years. Not one Jewish woman was defiled by an Egyptian, although we were the chattels. They could kill us, they could torture us, but no. Egyptian engaged sexually with a Jewish woman, only it happened once. The whole story, the Egyptian Moshe, the one who Moshe killed. The one had gone in and cohabited with one person's wife. Shomus was no other Jewish woman. As a result of that, every child born in Egypt is of Jewish descent. Paternal, maternal, it's all Jews. The pedigree is crucial. We're not a Jewish people unless we descend from the 12 tribes. Irrefutably, we're from the 12 tribes. How do we know? Because God attests, when the Jews are counted in the desert, every tribe that's mentioned, every family that's mentioned, the letters yud Hey, which are the letters of God's name, he says, I attest to the, the purebreds. They're the children of the parents, of the fathers. No Jewish one was defiled. How's that possible? How's that possible? 
Every Jewish room was for the take for the Egyptian master. But for some reason, they stayed away from the Jewish women. They would not engage with them. Why? What's the reason? A man normally is attracted to a woman, but somehow there was divine. Why? Why was the divine protection? Do you know why? So the Midrash tells us when Suri Menu was taken by Pharaoh, initially believing that it was Avram's sister, and he wanted to approach Sora, an angel came, and Sora says to the angel, smite him. And as she gave the order to smite, the angel had smitten Paro, and he realized he can't go near this woman. But it's not so simple. Suri Menu at that time was at a crossroads. If she would have said not, not to smite, and she would have been agreeable, you know what it means to be the queen of Egypt? The queen of Egypt meant there's the most advanced civilization in the world. And there's a lot to gain. She's still a human being. She had to make a decision. Her decision was, God forbid, definitely not. So because she met the challenge and would not allow herself to be defiled, and she made her, made, retained her modesty, every Jewish woman, her granddaughters, merited divine protection. That no Egyptian woman, as Pharaoh, who was an Egyptian, could not go near her. No Egyptian man will go near a Jewish woman when the Jews will go into bondage. That's the reason why no Jewish woman was defiled by what? By an Egyptian, by Egyptian male. So why was there a Sinai? Why were we qualified to receive the Torah at Sinai? Of course, we merited that divine protection because the Jews that left Egypt were of Jewish descent, not of Egyptian descent. That's why. But why were they those Jews who were Jewish descent, not Egyptian descent? It was the merit of Sora Imenu, Sora the Matriarch, because she did something and she was able to withstand that test. In her merit, all her granddaughters merited the special divine protection. But it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make sense. It, it, it does make sense. Because if God wants it to make sense, it makes sense. Because whatever he wills, who amar what, what he says it should be, that's the way it is. Regardless, if God says water, the water should flow vertically, hundreds of miles up in the air. But that's not the way it's supposed to be. That's all God says it's not supposed to be. But if God says that's the way it's supposed to be, rather than the water flowing horizontally, it flows vertically. Because every moment is a moment of ex nilo, and the way he wills it, that's exactly the way it is. Talmud tells us that when you stub your finger on the terrestrial level, you only stub your finger at that moment because it was pronounced from above that you're supposed to stub your finger. And the words of the Gemara, ain't other no kif etzbo etzbo lemalamato elam kif machrizen oso milamalo. If they announce from above you're supposed to, that's what happens. You know, a person goes, jumps out of bed, stubs his toe, and he sees stars. You say, I was so careless. A lot of people jump out of bed. If you've done it before, you didn't stub your toe. Why now? Because want God wants at that moment, for whatever reason, you should stub your fingers, your, your toe, or you should break your leg, or whatever it may be. You walk this path, you never, you never tripped. All of a sudden, now you're tripping. It's not because you're 98 years old and you don't see. You're just as aware, just as fit. This time you fell in a way. And you, you're injured. Why? Because God wants you to be injured. If you see life that way, within this context, there's a continuous takeaway. Why? Evidently, evidently, there's, there's correction to be made. And you're not become paranoid. It doesn't mean to say you know, for, you know why you fell. But we all know we're not perfect. And we know we merit Nidus Arachim, the attribute of mercy. But for some reason, at this moment, we didn't merit enough mercy not to be injured or not to take the financial loss. But these are all messages. Upgrade. Make corrections. That's definitely the message. For what? Across the board, we can make a correction. Every aspect of our lives is where to improve. There's always place for improvement. And that's the message. But that's, again, that's only because you believe Nothing happens randomly. It happens because it's supposed to happen because God wills it's supposed to happen. So it's a whole different perspective when we pray 
It's not just words. Because God has the ability to do anything. And God does these things. But you have to believe it. And you have to be worthy. So even when he doesn't respond, it's not because he can't. Of course he could. He could create a world. He can't respond to a little minute, whatever it may be. Of course he could. The answer was not worthy. But if we'd be more worthy, he would respond. But what's worthy? We have no idea what worthy is. We just have to keep upgrading. 